and just mess with everybody. Well, good morning. Welcome to Parish Presbyterian Church on this glorious Lord's Day. Welcome, especially if you are a visitor. It's a joy to be with you in the house of the Lord. And we have an invitation to the gospel from 1 Peter. God says in scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Well, in that great hope, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. You are our God, and we will give thanks to you. You are our God, we will extol you. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Amen.
In you my soul has shelter found And you have been from foes around The tower of my defense My home shall your pavilion be And underneath your wings I'll flee hear the scripture reading from Psalm 118. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I might enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord, the righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
now the reading of God's word as it is found in Acts chapter 4. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. seated. We're going through the book of Acts, and Jesus gives us the thesis and the outline for the book of Acts at the beginning. He told his apostles, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And Jesus' command becomes an outline for the rest of the book. They're in Jerusalem from chapters 1 to 7. And then they go a little bit further in Judea and Samaria in chapters 8 to 10. And from 11 to the end of the book, they're going to the end of the earth. So they're just following exactly what Jesus commanded. And we are looking now in Jerusalem which is the city that saw the salvation for the world, where the Savior laid down his life for sinners. And let's pray that God gives us eyes to see. Our Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son um, here to live among us. And we thank you for the redemption that Jesus accomplished in Jerusalem. And Lord, we pray that you would give us Eyes to see the hope of Jesus for our darkest sins. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I love looking at old maps. Um, I did not love geography when I was in school. But since then, I love looking and seeing these old, almost like artwork. If you look at medieval maps or ancient maps... And sometimes I look at them and think, I don't think they really knew what the world looked like. (laughs) But nice nice attempt. Um, And it's not exactly what you would get if you look at these old medieval maps, if you were to get on Google Earth. It's not exactly what it looks like. One of them that I love has a map of the whole world, and at the middle is Jerusalem. And that's not because they were confused and thought if you go to the middle of the earth, you're actually standing in Jerusalem. They were telling a story as they drew their maps. 
And in the medieval ages, they said, if you want to know the most important thing in the world, go to the city where Jesus died. That's the center of our world and the story of this, this earth. And we even catch a little bit of that in our speech today. When we talk about Jerusalem or that part of the world, we often call it the Middle East. It's at the center. It's the middle. And we talk about ourselves on a global scene. We are in the West. Well, West of what? <laughs> We're West of Jerusalem. And then there's East of Jerusalem. It's still in our vocabulary. Jerusalem is the city where Jesus brought salvation for the whole world. And so we're looking first in the book of Acts at that city, Jerusalem. And we're going to look at this story um, where Peter talks about these builders and the cornerstone. These builders rejected the cornerstone, but also the preacher denied the cornerstone. But despite all of that, Jesus became the cornerstone for salvation for the whole earth. So let's look first at who are these builders. So they're in Jerusalem where Jesus commanded them. And in Jerusalem, Jesus said, wait for the Holy Spirit. So they said, okay. They had a prayer meeting that lasted for several days until Jesus sent the Holy Spirit from heaven in answer to their prayers at Pentecost. And in Jerusalem, Peter preached a sermon where 3,000 people believed. And then the next sermon we read about, he heals someone and the thousands gather, at least 2,000 more believe. And I'm not very good at math, but I can tell you that after two sermons, they had 5,000 brand new Christians in Jerusalem. That's something that people notice. <laughs> you can't really just ignore. There are these 5,000 brand new Christians. And the leaders and the rulers heard about it and said, all right, we've got to stop these preachers. They're two sermons in and 5,000 converts. So we need to arrest them. So Peter and John are in jail and they're being brought before this Supreme Court of Israel. But the amazing thing from this story, we're getting a look at Peter preaching to every kind of person. He's been preaching to the commoners gathered at the temple. Now he's going to preach to the rulers. He's preaching to residents and travelers, conservatives, liberals, every kind of person. Peter says, you need to hear the story of Jesus. It's good news. And he begins in Jerusalem preaching to everyone. And this week we'll be looking at a sermon to the elites. Peter is speaking to the most powerful men of the Jews. But what's interesting, it's not really a sermon if you pay attention to what's going on. It's actually a trial in their Supreme Court. And this is his defense speech. But as you read it, you think, who's on trial? <laughs> Peter starts accusing the people who were there, his judges in this case. But Peter uses this as a platform to preach the good news. Well, who were these builders? Peter says, you the builders, who were they? So we're under the Roman Empire. They now govern Israel. But the Roman Empire said, listen, if you want a religious government, you can have it. And so the Jews continued with this religious government of 70 elders and the high priest. And it's an old way that Israel's been governed. Do you remember when Moses brought the people out of Israel? They were gathered and he was with his father-in-law Jethro. And there were millions of people. They were all coming to Moses with every dispute that broke out. And Jethro said, what are you doing? Moses said, well, I, you know, I need to tell them God's law and help them with their disputes. And Jethro said, why don't you bring help? Find men who are godly men that the people respect and have them help you govern this nation. 
And so Moses brought in elders that were um, voted by the people. They were recommended by the people. And God poured out his spirit on 70 of these elders to rule with Moses. And so ever since the time of Moses till the time of Jesus, they had a group of 70 elders and the high priest governing the nation. It's basically the supreme court of the Jews. Um, they were called the Sanhedrin, um, but that's, that's who are here with Peter, the supreme court. And by the time of the New Testament, there are Roman governors appointing the high priest of Israel. Now, this is not in the Bible. You will not find this. But the Romans said, listen, you can have your government, but we're in charge of your high priest, the most powerful man. And the Romans had appointed Caiaphas um, for a high priest for a while, and eventually they said, no, not you, Caiaphas, but we'll put your son-in-law, Annas, as high priest. So he's officially high priest, but they both continue um, the duties of the high priest and sitting on the Sanhedrin. So you have these two men, Annas and Caiaphas, and they're there as the high priests, and I want to give you their story. We're going through Acts, which is Luke volume 2. And most of the story about Annas and Caiaphas are in Luke volume 1. So I just want to introduce you to these two men, the high priests, Annas and Caiaphas. Um, they were the priests from the time of John the Baptist all the way through the death of Jesus, and they're still the high priests um, in Acts chapter 4. And the first time we hear about them, Jesus was gathered with his disciples and they're all talking, Jesus, who are you? Some people say you're Elijah. Some people say you're the prophet. And Jesus said, okay, who do you say that I am? And Peter, if you know someone in class like this, sometimes it was me, he's always the first one to raise his hand. Jesus, Jesus, I know. And Jesus said, okay, Peter, you tell us. And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, that is absolutely right. And because I am the Christ, the Supreme Court with Annas and Caiaphas, they will reject me, they will kill me, and God will raise me from the dead on the third day. So the first time we hear about Annas and Caiaphas, we're introduced to them, and Jesus said, they will kill me. And with full knowledge, Jesus set his face like a flint, like a stone, and said, I'm going to Jerusalem where I will lay down my life at the hands of Annas and Caiaphas. So that's the first scene we hear about them. The second scene, Jesus made it to Jerusalem, and he came riding on a donkey, and the streets were lined with crowds of people saying, Hosanna, which means save us, Hosanna, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're saying, you are the Messiah. And then Jesus entered the temple and cleansed the temple, turned over the tables, and began to preach in the temple. And guess who else was in the temple? Annas and Caiaphas. They were there. And they confronted Jesus and said, by what authority do you do these things? And let me put that in modern terms the high priests were saying this, who do you think you are? Who are you? Oh, Jesus from Nazareth, he has no college degree, and here are the experts. He walks into town like a king, greeted with shouts of, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then he turns over the temple like he owns it. So the high priest walked up to Jesus and said, who do you think you are? By what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus answered their question with a question. Don't you love it when people do that? <laughs> and Jesus said to them, I have one question before I answer yours. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And to explain what that question was, um, Richard Gaffin wrote a lot about the theology of Luke and also of Paul and said this, baptism is an index of your ministry. And if you pass judgment on someone's baptism, it amounts to a judgment on his ministry as a whole. 
So Jesus was saying, where did John the Baptist get the authority for his whole ministry? What was he doing? Where did that authority come from? And Annas and Caiaphas said, okay, huddle. So they brought in all 70 of the elders and he said, listen, if we tell Jesus, John the Baptist's ministry is from God, he will say, well, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say that actually it's not from God and it's just John the Baptist doing whatever he felt like doing, the people will kill us. He said, okay, Jesus, we have an answer to your question. We don't know. <laughs> We're not sure where his baptism came from. And Jesus said, okay, well, then neither will I tell you where my authority comes from. So Annas and Caiaphas were put to shame publicly in their attempt to stop Jesus and his ministry. They were looking for an opportunity from this point on to kill him, but they weren't sure how to do it because the crowds were in favor of Jesus until in the next scene, an opportunity fell into their lap. One of Jesus's 12 disciples came secretly to Annas and Caiaphas and said, if you pay me enough money, I will hand Jesus over to you. And Annas and Caiaphas said, okay, we'll pay you 30 pieces of silver if you'll do it. And Judas said, deal. I will hand Jesus over to you. No crowd, no danger from the people. Just pay Judas his money and Annas and Caiaphas, you can have Jesus. The next scene. It was night on a Thursday and Judas was leading Annas and Caiaphas, and he said, listen, I know exactly where Jesus will be. He will be praying in a garden. Have you ever thought of that? Judas said, I know how to betray Jesus. He'll be in his prayer garden. And so Judas led Annas and Caiaphas, and he identified Jesus with a kiss, and Jesus said, have you come out as against a robber with swords and, and clubs? Wasn't I with you in the temple teaching every day? You never laid hands on me in public. But this is your hour, Annas and Caiaphas, and the power of darkness. So Annas and Caiaphas were finally getting their way through the power of darkness. They were looking Jesus in the eye when they arrested him while praying. They dragged him to their palace because, you know, the high priest has a palace. Well, not before that, but now he has a palace. And they dragged him to the palace and he called an emergency meeting of the Supreme Court. Next scene. It's dawn on Friday morning and Annas had gathered all of the 70 elders with him at first light to handle this case. And Annas and Caiaphas asked this question, Jesus are you the Christ? Just tell us. And Jesus said, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated on the right hand of the power of God. Annas and Caiaphas said, and all the elders, are you the Son of God then? And Jesus said, you say that I am. And Annas and Caiaphas tore their clothes and said, what further testimony do we need? We heard it ourselves from his lips. It's the death penalty. But, you know, the high priest actually is not allowed to put people to death because he's the high priest. So then he had to send him to the Roman governor who has the authority of the sword and sent him to Pilate. And after Pilate examined Jesus, Pilate said, I, I don't see anything that he's guilty of, certainly nothing that I should sentence him to die. And so Pilate was going to let Jesus go. But do you know who else came to the trial? Annas and Caiaphas. And they said, we found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar. 
Jesus said we shouldn't pay our taxes, Pilate. This is bad. And then he said this. Jesus said he is the Christ, a king. That's treason, Pilate. So Annas and Caiaphas are there prosecuting the case against Jesus. And Pilate still said, I, I don't see anything worthy of death as I examine Jesus. And he wanted to let him go and execute Barabbas instead. But Annas and Caiaphas roused the mob. And they got the mob to out shout Pilate, yelling, crucify him. The high priests were leading them. The eighth scene. Jesus was being nailed to the cross in a public execution for our sins. And surely the high priests wouldn't have come to see a gruesome execution, right? Well, no. Annas and Caiaphas were there. They wanted to watch Jesus die. And so they came while Jesus was on the cross in agony, and they mocked a tortured man. And they said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. So Annas and Caiaphas and the elders and the rulers resolved the Jesus problem. Or so they thought. Next scene. This is just about two months later. Annas and Caiaphas were at work in the temple, and they heard a commotion, and thousands of people were gathering, and someone started speaking. This lame man was healed, and he was jumping around the temple, and someone stood up and said, he was healed in the name of Jesus. It's back. And Annas and Caiaphas, after watching Jesus die, they were disturbed again by the name. Now, if anyone does not deserve to hear the gospel of Jesus, it's these two men, Annas and Caiaphas. They were the ones that God appointed to build the church, build his people, build the temple. There was an actual building project going on. And these builders of God's people who went into the Holy of Holies, Annas and Caiaphas were the high priests. They brought the blood of the lamb on the day of atonement and sprinkled it on the mercy seat. They hated Jesus. They hated him, even his name. As soon as Peter said, well, this man was healed in the name of Jesus, they said, that's it. Arrest those two men and put them in jail. We'll examine them tomorrow. These two men, if it were me standing before them, I would have been tempted to say, you lost the privilege to hear about Jesus. You've lost it. And I want you to pay attention to what Jesus says to Annas and Caiaphas. What does Peter say? So those are the builders. That's who they were. Um, I also want to look at Peter, who was preaching. Do you remember Peter? Just a couple months ago, he also had a trial. He wasn't actually the one standing in front of the authorities. He was there with their servants at the fire, and a servant girl said, wait, I think I recognize you. You're one of the followers of Jesus. And Peter, who's the spokesman for all of us, said, I never knew Jesus. I didn't know him. And do you remember Peter went on to deny Jesus two more times before the rooster crowed? And Jesus is there as a spokesman for you and for me. How many times are we ashamed of the name of Jesus. And we deny him again and again and again. Well, this time, instead of it being a servant girl, Peter is surrounded by 70 men. These are the most powerful Jews. They were trying him. 
And they had just done a similar trial a couple months earlier and put Peter's best friend to death. Peter was surrounded by the same men, the 70, the 70 men, and it's basically like standing as a sheep in a pack of wolves. And this was the moment for Annas and Caiaphas to triumph over Jesus once and for all. They have the leaders of the movement in custody in chains. They are set up for a public denial of Jesus, which would be an embarrassment to all of Christianity. It would probably be the final defeat of the movement. And so the Jewish leaders said, let's bury this Jesus problem once and for all, and let's have Peter do it. We heard about what Peter did. So they said to Peter, by what name... And what power are you doing this? And he's surrounded by the 70. They gave Peter every chance to be ashamed of the name of Jesus. They were asking, do you want to associate with the name of the man we just executed as a blasphemer? Do you want to be affiliated with that name? And what does Peter do? Well, before he opens his mouth, the Bible tells us everything we need to know. Then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit said. That's all you need to know. There's the difference. There's the change. Peter, the coward who denied Jesus three times, Peter becomes as bold as a lion and calm and clear. Listen to what Peter said. In the face of these 70 angry men, good old Peter made the good confession. Rulers of the people and elders, if we're being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Look at the clarity that's here. Are you examining me because I healed a crippled man? Is that why I'm on trial? My crime is that a lame man has been saved. Is that why you're examining me? Well, okay, I want you to know, actually, I want everyone in Israel to know that it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth that this man is healed. He's standing here. I have a witness. This man has never stood in his life. And he's standing here healed by the name of Jesus. And did you notice Peter said he is the Christ? Jesus is exactly what he said he is. Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. And then Peter said, Jesus whom you crucified. We're not talking about ancient history. Peter was just talking about something that happened 60 days before this. You know all about the crucifixion. Peter said, you watched him die. You prosecuted him. You persuaded Pilate to sentence him to death against his better judgment. You are the one that, that stirred up the crowd to say crucify him. You know all about the crucifixion of Jesus. You were there. And then Peter said this, God raised him from the dead. Yeah, you rejected Jesus but God raised him, and that's how this man is standing in front of you healed. This is my witness. And then Peter told them, quoted this verse from the Old Testament, Psalm 118. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. So Peter said, you are the builders of God's people, and how did you do in your job? You despised the cornerstone. But God is going to build that salvation for all his people on that one stone. Everything will be built on Jesus, the cornerstone. You rejected him, but God is using him to build his temple on that rock, Jesus, the name of Jesus. Now, I know for a fact that Annas and Caiaphas knew this Bible verse. Do you know how I know? Because Jesus quoted this exact verse a few months before to the same men. Jesus told them before the cross, you 
will reject me, the cornerstone, but God will use me to build his church. And then Jesus gave a warning. This is the stone and everything relates to this stone. Either you will fall and cast yourselves on that stone and it will break you, but you will be on a solid ground. Or that stone will fall on you and it will crush you to pieces. And Jesus warned them, beware how you relate to Jesus. And Peter quoted this verse a second time on the other side of the cross. Now, if there is anyone who has ever lived that does not deserve to hear the gospel, it's Annas and Caiaphas, these two men. They paid Judas. They pressed Pilate against his better judgment. They followed Jesus all the way to the cross so they could mock him in their victory. And what does the victorious Jesus do with these evil, powerful men? Jesus sent Peter to say this. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. What was the message that Jesus sent to these powerful, evil men? Salvation. Salvation. There's salvation nowhere else, but in the name of Jesus, you can be saved, Annas and Caiaphas. Jesus was offering salvation to the men who killed him through Peter. And this isn't really a sermon. They're not gathered in church in a worship service. This is a legal defense in a Supreme Court trial. And Peter said, listen, I'm going to use this opportunity to tell you about Jesus. Annas and Caiaphas, you will never find another path of salvation. This is it. You must be saved by this name alone. There's no other place for salvation. But if you reject Jesus, you are rejecting the cornerstone. And the whole structure of God's salvation for you will collapse. It won't be there. No Jesus, no salvation. But Jesus is strong enough to save you. But do you know what's the most surprising lesson that we get from this sermon? It's not just that Jesus is strong enough to save. The surprise is this. Jesus is willing to save them. He's willing to save the high priests and the 70 who condemned him to death. There is salvation in the mighty name of Jesus. But if you ever asked, yes, there is salvation in Jesus for religious people, clean people, intellectual people, good people. But is there salvation for me? Have you ever asked that? You know every sin you have ever done. You know the darkness of your heart in every area where it's gone. Blaspheming God's name, despising God, rejecting his law. With adultery, hatred that would lead to murder, theft, destroying other people's reputations. We've done every kind of sin. And do you ask the question, is Jesus willing to save me? knowing everything about me. Well, I'm here as an ambassador of Christ to tell you with all the authority of God, Jesus is willing to save you. Jesus is willing to save his enemies. The cornerstone is not only strong enough to hold you, the cornerstone is willing to save you just as he was willing to save Annas and Caiaphas who paid Judas and who persuaded Pilate to kill him. Jesus is the cornerstone powerful to save and he delights to save. So if you are a believer, go preach the good news 
to every preacher. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you give the good news of salvation to the greatest of your enemies. And so, Lord, in the hope of Jesus saving wretched sinners, we come confessing. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in men. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. Out of our distress, we call on you, Lord. Lord, answer us and set us free. The Lord has disciplined us severely, but he has not given us over to death. Lord, if you are on our side, we will not fear. What can man do to us? Lord, be on our side as our helper, and we shall look in triumph on those who hate us. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. And we have this assurance and hope of pardon. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. This is the promise of God. This This is is the the word word of the Lord. Lord. Therefore, in the same way you received Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to walk in him. So then, we are rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Therefore, let us abound in thanksgiving. Amen. Let's stand as you're able and let's sing. As we stand by the power and in the name of Jesus, we get to confess our hope to one another and before a watching world. Christian, what do you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy church, both visible and invisible, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Therefore, we praise you, triune God, and we join our voices with the angels, the archangels, and the whole company of heaven in this hymn of eternal praise.
seated. As Peter declares his defense before the high court, he proclaims the gospel of our salvation in no other name but in the name of Jesus. He says, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. And it has become the cornerstone. He's pointing to the cross, the rejection, the suffering and death of the cross of our Savior, who came to die for these wicked men in need of a Savior. And so on the night when our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he he, he took of the cup, and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, the blood that I shed for you. Drink all of it in remembrance of me. Dear ones, this meal comes with a warning. This meal is for the people of God, for those who have put their faith and trust in no other name but in the name of Jesus. If you're here today and you do not know the Lord Jesus, and you say, how could he save a wretch like me, a sinner like me? He came for wicked sinners. Hear this today. There is salvation, full and free, by faith in Jesus' name. His person and his work on your behalf. If you don't know him, refrain from these tables, but run to the cleft of the rock in Jesus' name. But for the people of God, come to these tables, lay hold of his mercy, and find grace in no other name. But in Jesus, let me pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the name that is above every name, that Jesus Christ is Lord over all. Oh, Father, we thank you for giving us your one and only Son, that we might have salvation, forgiveness in Jesus. And thank you for giving us a meal set apart to nourish our souls today with bread and wine, would you set them apart for holy use in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dear ones, we have three tables spread before you. Go to the one that is nearest to you. The outer ring is juice, the inner ring is wine, and we have a common cup and a common loaf with gluten-free bread on the white plates. And Pastor Jamie will be in the foyer for all of us who need prayer at this time. The gifts of his grace for you as people.
let's now go before the throne of grace in prayer. O oh Lord God, our strength and stronghold, our refuge in this day of distresses and woes, standing side by side with gladnesses and graces, to you all nations will come from the ends of the earth to this redemptive promise do we now cling. O oh, you, our rock, our fortress, our redeemer, our cornerstone. Make known to all men your might and power, that they might know that you are Lord. Make us as bold as Peter to declare that there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which men must be saved. Make us faithful enough to abide before your throne of grace, beseeching you to pour out new mercies on this and every wayward land. Hear now, Lord, our prayers. We cry out to you, Lord, for healing, for Craig and Melody, for uh, Joellen, Clef, Stephen, Doris, Alfonso, uh, Jean, Greg, Jem, and Susan. We pray too, Lord, uh, for uh, Sean as he ministers in East Tennessee uh, to those who have lost so much, and for the people in Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, and East Tennessee who have suffered such loss. Such devastation, such sorrow and sadness, would you make us the hands and feet of Jesus? Would you cause us to love our neighbors well, serve our neighbors well, with our words, with our deeds, with our resources, with our votes? Oh God, would you make us proclaimers of Christ in every arena into which you thrust us. We pray, Lord, uh, for uh, the Kafore family with gladness at the birth of their covenant daughter, Adeline Joy. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness. That little girl now surrounded by a gaggle of boys, bless her, use her, cause her to be a trophy of your grace. We pray, Lord, for our church planting a committee and team and pray that you would raise up strong, strong leadership, firm foundations, and that the entire region of Middle Tennessee would be filled with thriving churches. Start here. Start with us, O oh Lord, we pray. Dear name, the rock on which we build, our shield and hiding place, our never-failing treasury, filled with boundless stores of grace, we praise you. Now, shepherd of your people, lead us through this desert land and build up your kingdom. It is for this that we cry. It is for this that we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's now stand and sing.
be found dressed in his righteousness alone fall as to stand before the throne on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand the benediction today is from Psalm 118 the Lord save you the Lord give you success the Lord bless you from his house the Lord is God and he has made his light to shine upon us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. for joining us for Lord's Day worship. As many of you have asked, how can we help support the church and uh, areas of East Tennessee, North Carolina that have been hit in Florida with hurricane uh, relief support? We have an opportunity with one of our own members, Sean Harris, who's from East Tennessee and needs all of our prayer and support. Uh, you can read the um, the newsletter announcement there, but you can donate straight to that QR code or in the memo line of your check, just put hurricane relief and we'll make sure those funds get to the right people, particularly Sean at this time. We have a parish youth uh, retreat. This is the last day to register for that. So there's a QR code right there for you to sign up. Uh, that will be October the 25th through the 27th. We have a, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Pastor George is going to give us a Christian view of politics uh, on two Monday nights, uh, uh, October the 28th and November the 4th at 6.30 right here at the church. Please um, be there for that special occasion. Then we have a Reformation Day party on the 31st uh, and candy is needed for, for that special <laughs> event. Uh, so bring those bags of candy on church Sunday or uh, on um, youth Bible study nights. And then last but not least, we have a young adults uh, fellowship time this Friday night here at the church at 6 p.m. Uh, you can see Keegan Tenpenny for more details about that. Go in his grace and peace. <laughs> 